Okay, we're back. We're live. It's 4 o'clock. My goodness, how the first day of the year, the first business day of the year flies. But we're having a great day. We've had some great shows and great discussions, and I feel my mind is opening for the new year, but especially now with Russell Kohler. Welcome to the show, Russell. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here, finally. You know, yeah. Without any of the internet problems or being in another country, I'm <laughs> finally back. I'm finally in the studio. It's nice to actually talk face to face. <laughs> what a trip. <laughs> exactly. You know, Russell and I were talking, what, a couple of times, wasn't yep. it, from Istanbul, which was, uh, as I was tell telling him before the show began, you know, if we could talk to him and see Turkey through his eyes, it was like we were there. It expands our consciousness to be able to see it through his eyes. So fabulous experience both times. Exactly, and, and even through both times, I can't even, I can't do it justice. The, the country is far more complicated and, and so intriguing than even I could, could describe or explain, so. I don't know if I ever told you, Russell, but uh, one of the points of interest mm -hmm. for me about Turkey, aside the fact I've been there and mm -hmm. I've written about it actually, um, I'll tell you about that too. Um, was we had we had a, a host here, mm -hmm. um, and he was a guest also, and he's an Israeli by the name of Rafi Boritzer. Oh. And this is the time when things were going haywire in Gaza, two years ago mm -hmm. I think. And so I had a bunch of people from various walks of life and mm -hmm. various points of view come on the show, and we all talked about Gaza. And his thing, which I will never forget, ever, 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 is. You cannot understand the Middle East without understanding Turkey. Turkey is the capstone. It's a piece of Europe that sits right on top of the Middle East. And it has been enormously influential for hundreds and hundreds of years. So if you want to know what's really going on in the Middle East, you have to know Turkey. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, the modern governing structures of the political Middle East comes out of the, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire after the First World War. Of course, there have been conditions set after uh, after the First World War and into the 1970s. Um, but you know, regardless of all that, Turkey and its predecessors, the Ottomans, had a huge influence uh, over the the political landscape and the the socio-cultural landscape of the Middle East today. Which which makes me think of a thought I often have, uh, and that is the famous quote from George Santayana which was, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, don't, if you don't remember history, if you don't study history, you get to, you'd be doomed to relive history. And I frankly don't think that people uh, give enough respect to history because it is where we all came from. It, it is the vectors and the factors that make us what we are today. Exactly, and, and, and to your point, you know, I had a, I had a history professor at, at HPU, uh, Hawaii Pacific University, and he told me just a similar quote. I think it was from his own uh, mind. However, he said that you know history may not history repeats itself, but in different shades. And so you have these same events, but in different contexts. And so we need to, as you say, respect um, respect the events that is, that have happened throughout history in our own countries, as well as previously, to really understand and hopefully foresee what could possibly happen. I got another one for you. <laughs> it's my movie theory. Okay, I practiced law for 40 years, oh, right? wow. and I developed this movie theory. And my movie theory is that once you understood the, the, the lawyer on the other side, once you had his movie, because everybody has a movie, it's a series of characteristics and, and habits and stratagems and things that pop up. It's his whole you know, attitude, way of doing business, way of practicing law. Once you got the movie, then you could predict what he and his client were going to do in the next movie. So, and you know, I guess you could apply the same thing to people in general and to states and countries. Of course, you know, the factors change. You have to take that into account. But the movie theory is really an interesting way to start making a sort of futuresque, future, a futuresque kind of analysis, a projection. Of, of anything going so you know it's it's looking at the past mm -hmm. it's understanding the movie it's projecting it into the future <laughs> yeah no and, and i think you're absolutely right i mean the best way that we're able to you know hopefully again hopefully predict what you know decisions are being made whether they be in the middle east or in europe 
is based on what we've seen in the past, the, the sort of tendencies that these leaders, these leaders make. Of course, it's more difficult in democracies, considering leaders change every now and then. But in these you know, dictatorships or monarchies that we have in this region, it's a lot, more, it's a lot easier to, uh, to predict a sort of rational thinking uh, individual, hopefully, a rational thinking. Seems like <laughs> it is, but you know, um, I've been watching movies made in Germany lately. I don't know why, but um, you know, cable and the internet, um, they seem to be creating a lot of movies made in Germany lately. And one of the interesting subjects that these movies uh, uh, deal with is, is World War II and the Nazis and the camps and all those very unpleasant, terribly unpleasant, grotesque things. And the German filmmakers are making these movies and they are not in any way complementary to the Nazis. Um, and so what I'm getting is Germany has changed. Um, Germany is in, in dynamic now. Germany, for example, is remarkably kind to the migrants, you know, right now. And you say, gee, well, this is, this is uh, different. This is... So you have to understand that and you have to pick that up and, and see where it goes. And you have to be constantly alert to moving ahead with it. Mm. Exactly. I, I suppose uh, you have to allow for room for the ability for these states to, to possibly dynamically change. Yeah. And once you allow that room, your, your own prediction can be more flexible. Yeah, as and therefore more accurate. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about you for a little while. We met while you were in Istanbul. Yes. You were in school. What were you studying there? I was studying international relations uh, with a minor in diplomacy and military studies. Uh, Turkish political social dynamics fascinate me. Uh, they are always changing. Uh, always, uh, always dynamic. Sometimes, sometimes they're violent. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they're peaceful. Sometimes it surprises you, like this last election they just had, uh, where I was wrong and many experts. Yeah, Erdogan still in power, exactly, huh? With a landslide victory. You thought that he would get kicked out, didn't you? I th what I thought was, I thought that um, the previous election in June that the results would stay relatively the same, but it seemed like. Uh, people, Turkish people really bought into his message of we are the party of stability, we are the party of peace, and without us there's chaos. And unfortunately nationalism um, in many parts of the world uh, gets a lot of points at yeah, home. Yeah, yeah, it's the yeah. easiest way to, to gain an electorate or yeah. uh, get an election. It's an aspirational thing. We want to be stable. Exactly. So we vote for nationalism. And anybody who hands us that line, he's, he, yeah, I wonder about Donald Trump. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, so you left there a few months ago, yep. went to Washington. Mm -hmm. What are you doing now? Right now I am uh, working in the uh, Senator Brian Schatz's office as an intern. Uh, it's been a fascinating environment, quite a change from sort of my more active role uh, when I was in Istanbul. Uh, I, the people there are extremely passionate. Um, it feels like I'm in Hawaii. It's, it's been amazing. Uh, so it's been a great transition for me to be over there. And we're in touch with you. I'm so happy and pleased and proud about that. <laughs> Thank you, Russell. You're welcome. You're, you know, it's, it's not just now. It's, it's more than now that you're with us. So stay, stay with us. Now, of course, of course. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about some subjects now. Um, so we've been following, I guess we should start out, we did, did kind of start out with Turkey and what's happened. And Turkey uh, having a certain amount of terrorism from ISIS, a certain amount of fighting with the Kurds. Um, is, that, is that resolved? Is it better? Is it the same? Is it worse? What? You know, the situation in Turkey is, is unfortunately well, it stayed relatively the same. You know, the, the conflict between the PKK, the Kurdish terrorist organization uh, in Turkey, uh, and the government, uh, they're, still, they're still fighting. Um, there's still attacks both on both sides. Violent attacks. Exactly, violent attacks. And the Turkish government has uh, really used what we, would what we would probably see as martial law in these areas of southeastern Turkey uh, on, the on, the, on the populace. And so you have curfews um, for the entire populace of these towns and cities, as well as some, of course, police abuses and such. Um, they're really trying to clamp down on the security situation in the southeast. Uh, when it comes to ISIS, 
there have been improvements on the amount of arrests that have been taking place in Istanbul, in Ankara. Um, Turkey is one of the largest um, victims of ISIS terrorism. You had the bombings uh, in eastern Turkey against uh, the Kurdish party uh, in their political rallies, and you had the largest attack in Turkey in its history in the Ankara bombings, which killed over 100 people and injured almost 200. So Turkey's been one of the greatest victims in this world on, of, uh, from ISIS. And so has really, it's been really nice to see that their cooperation with the United States as well as the European Union in com combating this organization has certainly improved. Yeah, that tells us a lot, doesn't it? Uh, that if you collaborate uh, with the powers, uh, you'll be able to beat ISIS. We should talk more about that of as course. we go forward. Uh, just a short story, though. <laughs> when I was in the service back in the 60s, uh, there was a Turkish ship here. Uh, it was tied up at Pearl Harbor on some friendly visit. And uh, the commanding officer of the Turkish ship uh, contacted the commander of Pearl Harbor and said, look, there's a fellow here who's done some, some crimes on the ship and we want to hang him. And uh, it would be okay if we hung him in the morning at the dock here at Pearl Harbor. And the commanding officer of uh, Pearl Harbor said, no, we, we don't hang people here at Pearl Harbor. <laughs> We'd appreciate it if you would not hang anyone <laughs> at the dock of Pearl Harbor. <laughs> so. So the Turkish uh, ship captain commander said, okay, next thing in the morning, they steamed out to three miles or 12 miles, wherever it was. They hung the man out there and brought him back. And, and they're pretty tough guys, the they Turks, are, aren't they? They are. <laughs> yeah, the, the Turkish military is actually the second largest land uh, force in NATO. And so as a power, as an in influential power, hard power in the Middle Eastern region, it's certainly a, a big actor and a big player, which is why it's been able to influence itself uh, in Syria and in the region lately. Of course, being that it's a NATO power, it also ha has the restraint of, of keeping itself out of violent conflicts uh, because it has the pressure of being a NATO ally. Yeah. Let's go to that point about collaboration. You and I were, were talking generally before the show began about you know, the magic of uh, collaboration, the magic of um, the powers working together. And, it, you know, it's been suggested by events of the last six months that uh, the U.S. Um, needs to be there. Uh, and if the U.S. is not there, the thing begins to get fragmented and Europe gets fragmented, the Middle East gets more fragmented. And so it needs, a, may I say, a strong hand. And if that means boots on the ground, uh, well, <laughs> it's a political issue, but um, you know, there may be a value in that simply to maintain a kind of discipline in the area, an area which needs discipline. So my question to you is, how do you feel having lived in Turkey and having seen, you know, this collaboration, at least in a small measure, um, about the possibility of, of winning the war against ISIS by way of a collaboration between, you know, uh, the U.S., Britain, uh, some of the countries in the EU, um, is, is A, could that be done? And B, um, if no collaboration takes place, can it be done in some other way? I think it can be done. Um, but the most important aspect of this sort of collaboration, international cooperation, it has to involve the, the states of the region, it has to involve the Iraqi government, which uh, actually, uh, which is a great point, they, they took back the city of Ramadi I'm thinking in, of in northern Iraq. Um, but this sort of international cooperation has to involve the states of the region so it doesn't become another uh, foreign aggressor type war in the local perspective. Yeah, shades of the Crusades. Exactly, exactly. So we need um, the Iraqi government, we need um, these contingents in Syria, maybe not necessarily the Syrian government per se, but that, that could be said for, uh, saved for later, but we need these, um, these countries in the region to fight this regional enemy because it's really a problem that has been created out of their own governance systems and of course our influence as well, but of course, like you said, we need to be an influencer in this in this region, in the world. Because if we don't, the farther we isolate ourselves, the more dangerous it becomes for ourselves. Now, that doesn't mean that we should be the world's policemen, but we should not um, 
retract from the tradition of protecting the international um, structures that we helped create after World War II and after the fall of communism. Yeah. What I hear you saying also, in, inter, inter alia, is that, um, is that we have to be consistent, that we can't jump from one position to another, we can't um, let Congress push us in, pull us out, push us in, and we have to find a way to do diplomacy and international relations in a way so that people will know we're there. Uh, is that part of what you're saying? Exactly. You know, our policy at the beginning of this conflict, we were anti-regime, um, anti or the Bashar al-Assad regime. We were anti other powers involving themselves on a direct interventionary uh, aspect. And yet, as the conflict has progressed, we've certainly gone back on some of those aspects. We, um, this is the same government, we all have to remember, the Bashar al-Assad government in Syria, that conducted chemical weapons attacks on its own people. This is the same government that has killed um, over 80,000 of its own people directly. And this is the same government which has influenced and led to the growth of ISIS in its own country. And so the mere fact that we have certain representatives in Congress um, that are calling for more cooperation with the Assad government, more cooperation with the Russian government, uh, is only to our detriment. It's only to the detriment of the people of the region and the refugees who are fleeing the regime, not ISIS, the regime. What I also hear you say, or at least maybe it's me saying it, <laughs> is that you know, sometimes you have an executive, and you should let him do his job and not get in the way. And if Congress could learn that, we'd be better off diplomatically. Don't, don't uh, pull the president back. Let the president do his job as he sees fit. He is the president. And, and I think, just in my own observation experience of it, seems to me we could have avoided a lot of trouble if we just let him do his thing. Well, it's really interesting you say that. I think that you know, when President Obama was elected, he had a lot of public pressure to first pull us out of Iraq, then the surge in Afghanistan, and then now eventually... Don't forget Guantanamo. Exactly, the, you know, the pullout of Afghanistan, which yeah. is on hold now. Um, and so the presence uh, of, of enforcing a red line, like we, we should have, in my opinion, after the chemical weapons attacks yes. in Syria, yes. Um, it was an illusion of choice, I guess, as it were, yeah. uh, for the president to really step back, look at the situation, and say to himself, do I really want to involve myself in, other, in another war? And unfortunately for presidents, you, like you said, Congress is certainly one pressure, but the people themselves are certainly another pressure. Yeah. And unfortunately, in my opinion, again, you know, I'm no warmonger, but... Um, the longer that that conflict went on... Between the, the, the White House and, and the Congress and the people. Exactly, yeah. and the longer we stalled on our involvement in the Syrian civil war, the more dangerous it became for the United States and her allies. And we've seen that um, carried out by ISIS today. Yeah, in these times, you have to move quickly. And being stalled from a, an executive initiative becomes dangerous. You heard it here on Think Tech. You heard it from Russell Kohler, remarkable young man. We're going to take a break. We're going to we're going to think about what he said. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about more issues that he's been following. We'll be right back. Aloha. Hello. My name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at Think Tech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Kaui Lucas. I am the host of Hawaii is My Mainland here every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii at 3 p.m. I invite people who are doing interesting and inspiring things in our community to help us keep it local and keep it real. Tune in any Friday, 3 p.m., and also available on our YouTube channel and my blog, kawilucas.com. 
Hawaii is my mainland. Aloha. Okay, well, we have a, we have a question um, on Twitter. If history repeats itself, and if life is akin to cinema, what events or, firm, or films parallel the development of ISIS? Wow. Wow. Well, some of those prison camps sound equally amoral. Um, I mean, you know, the death camps of World War II, uh, maybe uh, the, uh, the Cambodian uh, killing fields. Uh, I can't think of anything else, though, in our time. Although I'm not saying it could happen <laughs> again. It could happen yeah. again. You know. I would certainly say any movie that has depicted the rise of, let's say, the Third Reich in Germany. Not to say that ISIS certainly has any of the political military power that Nazi Germany did um, at that time, but an ideology which is um, which is equally as destructive as it is seductive, um, and is based upon the idea that you will live a better life if you fight for this ideology. And so I would say, I can't think of, of a film offhand, but certainly, well, if, if we have any Nazi propaganda films, I'd probably say, <laughs> say one of those. Sure, <laughs> that's what they were aimed at, yeah. Well, I, I think it's, um, it's interesting to note that uh, at the end of World War II, we all said never again. And yet, it happened again. And yes. it's happening now, and not in the same magnitude. Exactly. But, the, but the idea is pretty much the same, chopping people's heads off because of their religion. Come on. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I guess what it shows you is there's a certain human characteristic that where this is always somehow at risk. And if you spark it the right way, it can happen again. Exactly. You have to be so careful to remain civilized. You know. In Hawaii, we're always civilized. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about uh, COP21. COP21, following on the heels of the, uh, the attack in Paris, a remarkable combination of events all within like two weeks. Uh, COP21 had a certain historical significance, and a significance for Europe anyway, and, and maybe hopefully for the US. Uh, what's your take on it? Well, the, the Paris Climate Change Summit um, was certainly a first for the world. It was the first ever uh, legally bu binding f framework f uh, on the fight of global uh, global warming. And you know, you had representatives from, I believe it was over 185 countries uh, there. Um, and it was the first time that really the world stepped up and decided that um, for the next generations, uh, we are going to fight to lower not only CO2 emissions, but to uh, contain the amount of global warming to under a 2 degrees Celsius limit. So it'll be interesting uh, what happens. It's, there's certainly going to be tough issues they're going to have to iron out once the agreement is actually signed in April. Um, they still need uh, around 50 countries, to, uh, which represents 55% of world emissions. Uh, to sign the document to get it passed. Um, it'll go into force in 2020, but they're going to have some issues that they're going to have to convince and sell to, their, uh, to the public about supporting this. Because as we know, um, with our own budget issues in, in the United States, uh, the, one of the uh, clauses in this, in this agreement actually obligates industrialized nations to help fund climate financing for poorer nations. And for developing nations, you only have to do that upon a voluntary basis. And so to sell that to um, these industrialized countries, the United States, Canada, the UK, European Union, to sell it to their public is going to be certainly a challenge. Uh, yeah. Well, this is humanity's way of saving exactly. itself or not. Um, but let me ask you this. You know, this, this says um, that we want to hold the increase in uh, emissions down to 2%, uh, I think, per annum, or as little as, or hopefully, you know, a greater reduction, not reduction, but holding it down to 1.5% increase per annum. But it assumes an increase. Um, if you were king of the world, 
What would you think of that agreement? We're living in an emergency. Mm -hmm. There are people who sit on that chair all week long and tell us from the University of Hawaii, which is a, a, a you know a global resource on understanding the planet, exactly um, that you know we're in an emergency here. We can't afford to fool around. There are storms that are happening that are unprecedented. Uh, there is microbial change in the ocean, in the environment, in every way that we don't fully understand, but we know it's not good. Uh, would you, as king, would you have done more? I probably would have looked at the, the current evidence, which is very, um, which, as the agreement sort of outlines, has been sort of a unanimous um, agreement amongst climate scientists that there is the possibility of human um, sort of uh, Destruction? Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right on, on the climate and that this will influence the temperature change into the future. And so I'd probably take that evidence and build a case around it and try to sell it to my... So if I was king, that's a different story. But if I, let's say, I'm elected president of the world... <laughs> okay. Um, it's I'd, coming. Exactly, it's coming. I'd, I'd make Be patient. A, I'd make a case <laughs> and, and hopefully convince as many people as I could that this is coming and that we do need to act in a different, we need to change our behavior. We need to understand that in order to save ourselves, sometimes, you know, we need to adapt. Um, you know, in the Marine Corps, you know, when, when I was at Valley Forge Military Academy, uh, one of my TAC officers, who's a Marine Sergeant, he used to say, you know, adapt and survive. Adapt and survive. All the time to us. If you don't adapt, you don't survive. Exactly. It's that and easy. So, you know, if the situation is as dire as these scientists have lined out in yourself, then we must adapt to survive. Yeah. So scary. I mean, uh, I, I, I think it was watered down. Sorry. And the, the question is, you know, if nothing happens for years and then it's a five year reopening, I'd make it, I'd open it up every year. Um, I'd, I'd make it an emergency. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this, be, this is your generation, not mine. Exactly. And, uh, Russell, you better watch out for those guys, you know, because they may be sleeping at the, at the stick. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got to do something, and uh, maybe it's a good baseline in the sense that, okay, we got them all together, almost 200 of them, and they did agree, although it was not completely binding mm -hmm. on some points, and, and, um, and they, they, they didn't commit to a full legal commitment mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, really stamp out global warming. But at least it shows a level of, again, collaboration. Exactly. And, you know, into the future, going maybe five, ten years, you know, now we're not starting from zero. Yeah. We're sta starting from a, from a signed framework, from a legally binding framework in which we can approve upon. Yeah. And as the situation I, I hope it doesn't get worse, but it seems as the, the models they've shown it will. Um, as it gets worse, um, we can improve upon that framework even more so. Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with the press, though, don't you? Including us, think tech. I mean, it's one of the reasons we exist, you know, to make a point here. And that, you know, Sandy the storm in New York, that wasn't an ordinary storm. And all these tornadoes that are coming around and all the other violent weather we've had. I always say every nice day in Hawaii is one day closer to <laughs> really bad weather. That's <laughs> so what we say in California. <laughs> every nice day in California, one, one more next to the big one. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. And, and, and I think people are beginning to get the idea that these storms are not normal. <laughs> Or they are the new normal. Exactly. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and I think, as we said uh, with one of our previous conversation, it's when it becomes the new normal is when it becomes sort of a, a more dire situation, when terrorism becomes the new normal. Yeah. Or when, you know, when any of these situations become the new normal. Yeah. And, and the risk is, this goes back to the very beginning of our conversation here today. It's George Santayana. It's like if we forget the way it was before the bad things got to be the new normal we have only ourselves to blame if we take each you know degradation as as the new normal and we forget the old normal we'll be living in a slippery slippery slope and it'll get worse and we won't do anything about it you know take Honolulu obvious that that sea level rise is going to eat up the beaches 
Do you see any public works projects out there to save the beaches? Mm -hmm. Not a thing. You know, there was a, a famous historian, I, I can't believe, I, I can't remember his name right now. He said that, you know, great empires, they don't, they aren't murdered. They commit suicide. <laughs> and, That's great. <laughs> you know, if, if we compare ourselves as, you know, humans, we're a species, the most dominant species on this earth, we, sh we better not commit suicide. So are you writing these days? Writing, yeah. Oh, I, I do write at, at work. Unfortunately, a lot of busy work, but uh, unfortunately, not too much time for, for me to write. <laughs> okay, well, that's my advice to you. You should write, <laughs> and you should send it to us, and we'll put it on the air. Or you can you can videotape reading it, and we'll put that on the air. We want commentary from you, Russell. <laughs> Definitely note taken. <laughs> <laughs> Russell Kohler, uh, Think Tech West Asia correspondent. We're talking about looking ahead, looking ahead in West Asia and Europe 2016. We'll be right back after this short break. You'll see. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Aloha. How you doing? It's me, Angus McDeck, asking you to come join us on Think Tech Hawaii Hibachi Talk. Join me and my two hosts, Gordo the Texan and Andrew the security guy every Friday from 12.45 till 13.45. See you on Fridays and remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. <laughs> okay, we're back. We're live with Russell Kohler, uh, straight from Washington, from the holidays, visiting family, whatnot here in Hawaii. Nay. And we're talking today about looking, looking ahead, West Asia and Europe in 2016 from Russell. Um, and this, and Russell is our Think Tech West Asia correspondent, no matter where he lives. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the migrant thing, because the migrant thing is changing Europe. And that doesn't mean that migrants are, you know, covering the EU. They're not. It's only X number of people against the population much, much larger. It's just that psychologically mm -hmm. and politically, they're having a huge effect. So. At first, it was a humanitarian thing, and Angela Merkel was very kind, and so were a lot of the other Western leaders, very kind. But, but then it started to get a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. what's, what's happening now? Well, you know, what's interesting is, you know, a lot of people are, are linking the migrant situation to the, um, to the growth of terrorism in Europe and around the world, and, you know, I would, I would probably I would disagree with those those individuals because uh, of the uh, people that have conducted terrorist operations in Europe, as we've seen the Paris attacks, um, these were all EU nationals. These were all EU citizens. They'd grown up in the EU, uh, whether it would be Belgium or France, their entire lives. Right. They were not migrants. Exactly. They were not migrants. Uh, maybe their parents were, but they had been raised in European systems. Mm -hmm. um, these people that are fleeing a probably the worst violence that any of us will ever see, hopefully, um, are making extreme sacrifices to bring not only themselves, but their children and their families a better future. Um, I actually had the opportunity to speak with a very good friend of mine, uh, Marie. Uh, she works for uh, the Boat Refugee Foundation in Lesbos, Greece. And she actually provided emergency relief aid to those refugees coming over from Turkey across the Aegean. And you know, just from my brief conversation with her this morning, I could see the, the emotional hardship, the, um, the, the absolute um, sacrifice in her eyes that these people have to go through. Um, a lot of the things she, she's seen, she's interacted with, uh, certainly I did not know. Um, and I don't think a lot of people know in this country as well as uh, in the rest of the world about how horrible the situation is for these fleeing refugees. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're not fleeing because it's a, 
It's a good thing. It's, they're fleeing because uh, they're worried for their lives, the lives of their family. One thing, you know, I worry, I mean, I wonder about is, uh, you said they cross the Aegean Sea. Why don't you just walk on land? Can't you walk on land and get to the soft underbelly that way? Well, unfortunately for the refugees, um, the Turkish government, as well as the Bulgarian government, has done a very good job of policing that border from um, Edirne, which is the northern, uh, just north, uh, west of Istanbul along the, the Bulgarian border and so is the, uh, so of the Greeks. And so the, it's up to the Turkish and Greek coast guards to police a body of water they can't possibly uh, police in order to catch the 2,000 migrants that come a day. Still and now? Still now, still now. Um, my, my friend Marie, she actually returned to the Netherlands uh, just, uh, I want to say, December 27th she returned. And so she's been there for, for months and months. And yeah, according to her figures, it was 2,000, 2000 a day still. Um, it's a horrible situation. Um, it's unfortunate that these people themselves are being taken advantage of. And the perception that we have uh, of people, uh, of these people, both in this country and in Europe, uh, is, is unfortunately a negative one, uh, a, a very negative one, which I don't think they understand the sort of sacrifices that these people make and yeah. the absolute manipulation that yeah. these people go through in order to bring their families and themselves to safety. Yeah. There's a kind of teeter-totter over there about groups that are liberal and take care of their very, you know, humanitarian and groups that are reacting conservatively and don't want that and think that this is going to lead to bad things. And, and Europe is in a, in a pretty shrill conversation about it. Exactly which is going to reflect itself in a political way soon enough. Um, I think um, this is a very hard time for Europe uh, because they're, they got, the, you know, whatever else was going on, this has come right up to the top of the priority list. And it doesn't help the EU function. I mean, last time we looked, there was all this trouble about Greece. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, is Greece fixed now? No. <laughs> It's not fixed. Is, is the refugee problem fixed now? No, it's not fixed. Are the stabbings in, uh, in Jerusalem fixed? No, it still happens. It's the fickle finger of the press moves on. And again, like uh, George Santiano, we forget what happened just a, a few days, a few weeks ago. And that's the problem with, with the news. Yeah, and, it's, and you know, it's so sad in the EU where when you think of the European Union, you think at least uh, political scientists and analysts, they think of the EU has great soft power. It has great ability to attract other people, it has great economic power. Uh, it, it uses its humanitarianism to really uh, promote itself in the world. The European Union doesn't really have much of hard power, certainly of cooperation between themselves. The unfortunate thing is what we have now coming out of the refugee crisis, the migrant crisis, uh, the economic crisis in Greece is, well, it looks like the EU is having trouble with their soft power. They're having trouble convincing themselves that they should pursue these humanitarian policies. And they've consistently not had the sort of hard power that it needs to help um, promote peace in these certain regions. And so what it comes to now is Europe is becoming, well, rather stale and rather static. Um, so it, it has uh, to. What did you say about you got to change with your your marine? Uh, you have adapt, adapt and survive. They're not adapting. Exactly. This is not a good thing. Exactly. So you mentioned before, and I don't quibble with it, that we should not assume a relationship between the migrants and uh, and the terrorists. But um, I think we can come to the conclusion that ISIS is in Europe. They're recruiting in Europe. They're spreading their their poison in Europe and they're making ordinary European citizens into murderers. That's a really remarkable psychological process, how they do that. But as I said before, you know, under the veneer, we're mammals, and, you know, human beings are capable of being turned into monsters. That's the way it works. And so we have ordinary European citizens that are being turned into monsters. Um, so clearly, um, ISIS has found a way to get into Europe and do damage in Europe. Um, how widespread is that? How troubling is that? It's very troubling. And you know, it's, it's very sad because 
um, like the experience we had with Al Qaeda in the mid early 2000s um, with the um, Atocha bombings, the London train bombings. I mean, these, these people didn't train with Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. These people were radicalized at home. And it's the same thing with the, with the Parisian attackers. There were uh, two that traveled to Syria and back, but more so than not, um, these, these individuals who were radicalized are radicalized at home. And it's a sad fact that um, you have an ideology which takes advantage of the vulnerability of these young people in Europe from these um, isolated communities, um, and by isolated I mean disenfranchised communities in these states where it's really a two-way problem. It's a problem where you have this uh, seductive, destructive ideology um, in the form of ISIS, um, convincing these kids that in order to, you know, to change things in their country, they have to fight and they have to die. But it's also a problem with that the European governments are facing in providing a more inclusive society to these communities. And so what we're having now is a problem that is going to be very difficult to solve in the future. Yeah. You know, I, uh, a few weeks ago, somebody sent me a link to a, a movie uh, of, a, of a young Arab man who had converted to Christianity. And he was from the Middle East. And he was, it's a movie directed at the president, our President Obama. And he said, President, you, you have to, uh, you've been, you've been uh, avoiding a, a, a primary issue here. And that the issue is that within Islam, there, is, there are the seeds for ISIS. Um, that there's a violence there. And it, you, can't, you can't say that it's not related. It is related. And he said, I'm, I was a Muslim and I you know, trained and I learned to hate when I was a kid. And, and now I'm, I'm better. I went to school. I thought my way through to a different conclusion. Um, and I'm here to tell you, don't, don't think that there's a relationship. And if you want to solve the problem, you have to build that into your thinking. Um, that's very interesting, this, this movie is going around. Um, but it, it creates, you know, it opens this issue, which I'm sure exists in Europe and in the U.S., as, you know, can you, can you uh, exclude Islam from the blame? Can you say, uh, we, we know that these guys are, they're sort of tripping off some Islamic concepts, the violent part of the Koran, maybe, uh, and they're doing their violence, but you can't blame all of Islam for that. Uh, the question is, which part? <laughs> Where's the line? I, this must go on in Europe, and oh, I know it goes on in the U.S. Of course, and you know, it's, I think it's a fundamental question that has been asked many, many times, uh, even, even since 9-11. And I would argue that, no, the, the relationship there is a political one. Um, where we see political chaos, where we see societal, cultural chaos, we see radicalization, we see terrorism. Where we see political, cultural, societal peace, like in Indonesia, 500 million Muslims, the largest Islamic state in the world, peace. Uh, when we see it in Malaysia, uh, peace. Uh, when we see it in Bangladesh, we see peace. And when we move over to the Middle East, you see the conditions set. Uh, you have a great power rivalry in the region, Iran, Saudi Arabia. You know, this goes beyond the fact that they're Shia, Sunni rivals. This is mainly a geopolitical rivalry, uh, two oil uh, powerhouses in the region trying to exert their influence. You have dictators in the region that are abusing the human rights of their own citizens. And unfortunately, it's out of this political chaos that you sow the seeds, as it were, of this Islamic radicalization. It's the political capitalization yeah. of Islam. Yeah. It's not Islam. Exactly. So you have to watch out for who's trying to manipulate the tenets of Islam one way or the other. Exactly. Because in Turkey, as in a country like Turkey, which has elected more national leaders that were females than the United States had, <laughs> same, in Indo Perfect. Exactly. <laughs> same in Indonesia, they all have their problems, so do we, but they're relatively peaceful. They don't have that sort of 
Islamic radicalization you see in this specific region. In Turkey, uh, most of the terrorism and the threat to the United States in Turkey is actually the Marxist revolutionary parties. It's not necessarily Islamic terrorism. The last two attacks on the consulate, on the U.S. consulate, were the Marxist communist organization, terrorist organizations. And so what you have is a sort of, uh, sort of misinformation as well as uh, a manipulation of facts to really pursue a certain perspective and view of what really is a political problem, a Middle Eastern problem yeah. that happens to involve Muslims. Yeah, sometimes things are not as they seem. The scary part, maybe scarier, is that sometimes things are exactly as they seem. Exactly. But who's to say when? <laughs> Russell Kohler, great to see you in person. Great to have you here on the show. It's great we to have be to here. continue this discussion wherever you are in the of world. Of course, no problem. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha.